there is a new anime series coming out next month, Lupin the Third Part Six, and so uh, it is my sacred duty and honor to do a presentation to inform everybody about uh, what's good because this anime is heralding in the 50th year of animation for the franchise. So there's a lot to talk about and people don't know where to get started or if they should get started. And I'm here to uh, illuminate the path, I guess. How's that? Is that sufficient? Perfect. You're doing great, sweetie. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. All right, cool. Uh, so yeah, uh, without further ado, Lupin the Third and you. It's a primer on the history of the series. 50 whole years, yeah. Okay, so the first thing you need to know about any of this is that Lupin the Third, at its core is fan fiction. Uh, way back in 1905, a French author by the name of Maurice Leblanc publishes The Arrest of Arsène Lupin. Uh, he invents in this book the gentleman scoundrel archetype, which you will see across media in the centuries uh, following. And it's, it's you know, well-received in France, kind of a niche book. It's kind of on the par of like uh, Sherlock Holmes, a little bit less well-known. Uh, it didn't really leave France too much. Uh, so that's in 1905. We fast forward a couple of years, uh, like 65 years, and then we have a Japanese mangaka by the name of uh, Kazuhiko Kato, who goes by the nom de plume Monkey Punch. He publishes Lupin the Third. That's in 1969. This is the manga. Uh, so the story here is that Lupin the Third is the grandson of the Arsene Lupin from the novels. Uh, and so Lupin the... Uh, yeah, that would be Lupin the First, is the one in the novels. Uh, and outside of France, Lupin has been localized as the wolf because of a dispute with the copyright of the LeBlanc estate. Uh, so, like, they are intrinsically tied together. It wasn't until 2005 that they finally became public domain after 100 years uh, because European copyright law is slightly more forgiving than uh, Mickey Mouse copyright law. Uh, so we're here. And so now we can finally call it Lupin outside of France. And so essentially this is a work of fan fiction about what was a 65-year-old novel at the time. Uh, now it is well older than that, right? Uh, so we've got our beloved cast of characters, right? We've got Arsène Lupin the third. As we said, he's the grandson of the famous Arsène Lupin. Uh, he leaves calling cards and announces his intent to steal because his ego is out of control and he's a huge ponce. Uh, he traditionally always gets what he at he's after, like no matter what. He is a huge womanizer and he's almost certainly polypan. Uh, uh, one of my favorite things about the way this character is drawn is how disgusting they make his hands. Uh, they're these like terrible knobby yaoi hands that are always really hairy. Uh, I thought this was a really good. This is like one of the best stills I think of the series because it emphasizes a lot of the really good art direction, like the weird banana shaped head the like super gross realistic hands and like the emphasis on cars uh so this is like a really good distillation anyway uh next beloved character who is not you know f uh the third from an existing book this is what we call an oc original character uh daisuke jigen he is impossibly good with a gun he is lupon's partner in both life and crime he is really really cool and like seriously he's like a really good gunman like that's his whole thing shoots gun never misses uh, he's like almost certainly gay, uh, more than just like a, oh, haha, he hangs out with Lupin all the time. In like the anime, he like is not phased by like femme fatale types. I don't know what this means. I boast. I don't know what that means. Um, but yeah, like he has in a lot of different incarnations, he'll have like the story of like, ah, the last time I loved a woman and then something terrible happens to her, right? And he's like, I'll never love again. Um, and he, like, is not impressed by women who try and seduce him. Uh, there's a, a whole bunch of... That's a whole other lecture, uh, talking about the, the sexuality of Daisuke Jigen. I'll save that for the next time. Uh, we've got uh, Goemon Ishikawa the 13th. Uh, so he is... This one is an ancestor again. Ancestor of the 1500s era folk hero by the same name. He is a samurai in the 20th century and now 21st century. Uh, he was introduced in the manga in, like, the 5th or 8th chapter... Uh, to make it feel, and I quote, more Japanese. This is not a joke. I have a footnote for this. Uh, that is a direct quotation from Monkey Punch himself in the directorial interview for the OVA Dead or Alive. Uh, he brought in Goemon because he felt like the other characters were too Western. Huge edgelord, like super brooding all the time. Uh, he got his samurai powers by meditating under a waterfall and being a ball cell his entire life. Uh, it's really great. We love Goemon. He's, he's a soft baby boy. 
Um, let's see. We've got uh, Fujiko Mine, who is like the like platonic ideal of the femme fatale trope. It like does not get more distilled and like perfected than this. Uh, she's important to know that she's like super capable on her own. What takes those other three guys like to do, she can typically match on her own. A lot of uh, stories involving these characters are like in media res, while well, the three of them and her bump heads as they both try and steal the same thing. Uh, she has Lupin wrapped around her finger. She constantly torments him. Uh, she can be an ally or a rival, depending on the situation. And her name means the Twin Peaks of Mount Fuji. I'll leave it to you to guess why. And finally, uh, the last like mainstay character from the original manga, uh, we have Inspector Koichi Zenigata. He is super dedicated to arresting Lupin. Uh, like it's his complete obsession. He's like the foremost expert on the antics because he's been chasing him forever. In uh, various language translations, he is affectionately referred to as uh, Tosan, which would be Japanese for dad, old man, pops, etc. Um, that's like his whole thing. He's also like really capable, but he's always kind of made to look like a clown because his rival, his chosen rival, is also like hyper capable. So whenever he has to deal with like small fry criminals, he like squashes them immediately, but he's constantly foiled by Lupin. And uh, yeah, big, big himbo energy. Uh, typically he's like the, you know, the, uh, archetypal, like, sense of justice, heart of gold, good cop, uh, which is why I think it's also important to note that he is not real, uh, and he is a completely fictional character. So, uh, the next part of Lupin Third that I want to talk about, though, is, like, it's really, really fucking influential. Those five characters have put brain worms in more people's heads than just mine. Even if you've never heard of the franchise, have never watched any of its uh, episodes, have never read the manga, I almost guarantee that you've seen something that is more of a send-up to it than you think. You are not immune to Lupin the Third references. <clears throat> so let's start small, right? Like, what is an homage typically in animated media? It's usually like you have a cool little frame that's like similar to a frame in a previous show uh, that's a nice little nod or wink to the uh the thing that you're trying to reference right because you love it so much you want your viewers to know that you love it and it was really important to you so you have to put it in your work uh at the base level the most common loop on the third reference that you'll find in media is this iconic run cycle from uh, the pilot animation in the opening of the pilot animation lupon's doing this really exaggerated run with his arms against a brick wall as guns are being fired at him there's a spotlight that really makes a stark silhouette and gives some really harsh shadows you will see this run cycle referenced parodied what have you in a whole host of media these are the four that i could think of off the top of my head there are definitely more if you find one just tweet it at me like immediately when you see it take a screenshot and just at me at fom taro loop on reference hit send i love to see these things it makes me genuinely happy uh so here we have in no particular order uh red line which is a cool ova about racing uh, and we'll get get to get to red line again later in a little bit uh, Persona 5, which kind of apes Lupin's whole thing about like being a gentleman thief. His stand is Lupin the first. But I guarantee that the concept of the gentleman thief, Phantom Thief, was in the consciousness, the cultural consciousness of Japan because of Lupin the third. Uh, Persona 5 would not exist as it does if not for this anime. Uh, Outlaw Star, just another, you know, run of the mill anime. Um, and one I learned about recently, Akatsu Stars, which I think is a rhythm gacha game. Uh, which is in 2016. So a uh, whole, whole gamut of uh, years and different kinds of franchises. They all pay send up to this little run cycle. Okay, cool. You know, whatever. There's references in media to other media all the time. Big deal. It doesn't make it influential. It just means a couple people really liked it. We can go beyond that. Uh, beyond just a little individual frame, we can make it the entire premise of like an episode or something like that. Uh, so we have the Otaku no Video episode where they uh, parody Castle of Cagliostro. There's a whole thing in Fooly Cooly that made no sense to me the first time I saw it. But uh, upon watching it again, having seen Lupin, I realized the entire episode is just like madcap uh, non sequitur references to that show. So uh, we have like Otaku no Video in the top corner here. Uh, there's the iconic spring-loaded coochie punching bag or boxing glove scene from the opening of Lupin that's in Fooly Cooly. Uh, he even does like the thing where he dives out of his suit um, which is what Lupin does in a lot of media. That's like also iconic. Um, the whole episode is just a reference to that for some reason. 
Uh, we've got Full Metal Alchemist, which is like completely a different genre, not even typically like a comedy or anything. Episode 10, The Phantom Thief. Again, Phantom Thieves being a thing Japan thinks about because of Lupin. Uh, doing a very iconic Zenigata pose. Uh, he looks strikingly like, uh, you know, Zenigata or maybe Inspector Gadget, and we'll come back to that later as well. Uh, and even Jintama um, had its an episode about Lupin. Uh, episode 97, exaggerate the tales of your exploits by a third. Uh, you cannot even tell the difference side by side here. Uh, right side is Jintama, left side is Castle of Kelios or the movie. Uh, and it's, you know, clear as day. These things are all taking their references from Lupin. Uh, but we can go bigger than just anime. Um, oh yeah, here's another still from that same Fooly Cooly episode that I did not understand even a little bit without the cultural context of Lupin the Third, uh, because I had no idea who is Monkey Sensei prefers red. What does that mean? Talking about author Monkey Punch and preferring the red jacket over the green one. Uh, so like now that I've watched this episode, I'm like, oh, huh. Weird that they did that, but at least I understand. Uh, what do we got next? So yeah, beyond just anime, though, uh, there are Lupin references in your favorite video games. Castlevania, which was published in 1986, is largely influenced by Lupin III. Here are two backgrounds that are more or less direct traces from the Castle of Cagliostro. There's a whole level in that game where you're running inside of like a gearbox clock tower that is a direct reference to the final climax of the movie, uh, where Lupin is similarly running across gears trying to vanquish a villain. Uh, it's important. People think about this a lot. I'm not alone. I'm telling you this so that everybody else knows that they've there are other people with brainworms. It's not just me. Cool. Okay. So we have these, you know, knowledge winks, animation references, things like that. That's cool. But is that really influential? Like, okay, everybody gets referenced a little bit. We can go bigger. Uh, what if instead of just a little... Oh, actually, yeah, I do have one more note on this before I talk about us going even bigger. Uh, Lupin has escaped Japan also. It's not just a matter of Japanese anime and Japanese games loving this guy. As recently as 2020, here's some Western media that has some clear as day Lupin references as well. Uh, DuckTales, the brand new cartoon, 2020, has a whole episode arc where they go to Japan. Uh, you, we meet characters that are obvious send-ups to Lupin and Zenigata, right down to the weird bow-legged run that he does. Um, in earlier uh, in that series, there's a Fiat driving by with Jigen as a dog popping out of the roof. So Lupin's found his way over here as well. Um, it's not just a, a big fish in a small pond kind of situation. It's got worldwide appeal. But again, these are still like niche little like nods, winks, etc. Uh, but it goes beyond that. What's more than having a throwaway character be a Lupin reference is having a series mainstay be a Lupin reference. Uh, so I present to you April O'Neil, who you may recognize from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Uh, on the left side here, we have the final episode of the Red Jacket series from 1977. We've got Fujiko with her hand cam in her yellow jumpsuit. And then we have April O'Neil uh, looking exactly like her 10 years later. Now you may be thinking, okay, but like, she's like a reporter. It's a coincidence, right? Surely it's just like, okay, that's a common outfit. Jumpsuits are powerful. You make a strong woman by putting her in a powerful jumpsuit. But I can present to you irrefutable proof from the man who made the character himself. Uh, this is from David Wise, written on the Technodrome, which is the TMNT fan forums. Uh, somebody asked him if the character was a reference to a Doctor Who outfit, which I've never seen. And he responds, no, no, no. It's based on Fujiko Mine in her iconic yellow jumpsuit from this one episode this one time. Uh, someone else has correctly guessed this. So, you know, from the man himself, uh, I've got a footnote here I can post later if you don't believe me. It's real. Uh, Western authors were like fawning over Lupin the Third. They think it's really important. But okay, uh, you've got like a character that's a reference, oh, like a, a series mainstay character that's a reference to Lupin. Can we go bigger than that? Like, has he exerted more influence in the world than even that? Uh, and the answer is yes. What's more than having a character? Having an entire series influenced by you. Uh, so on that note, I'll introduce you to Lupin the Eighth on the left here. Uh, Lupin the Eighth was in 1982 a joint project between Deke who you might know from Sonic the Hedgehog or the Super Mario Brother cartoon, which are, you know, beloved classics in their own right. Uh, and TMS, who are the longtime holders of the Lupin IP, they came together because they wanted to bring Lupin for real overseas and make a, like a product that had a global appeal and introduce it to the markets uh, overseas and everywhere. So we come up with Lupin the Eighth. 
it's pretty much exactly the same, right? It's the same characters, except they're the descendants of the ones in the previous series. It takes place in space now because it's cool. Uh, that's really all there is to it. Oh yeah, and also, I guess there is one other kind of minor change, shall we say. Instead of being a thief in this one, Lupin the Eighth is a detective, just like Zenigata, but Zenigata was also going to chase him for some reason. Uh, and they did this because they thought that having your uh, hero be a criminal was not going to fly in a lot of countries' markets, and they might have been right, but we'll never know, because Lupin the Eighth got cancelled pretty shortly after production. Uh, the first full episode was animated, uh, never dubbed, no music recorded for it or anything, and it was actually amazingly released to the public as part of a box set in Japan a while ago. If anybody wants to watch it, I do have it um, on hand. I could do like a movie night sometime. Again, there's no dialogue though. Um, no audio recorded. It's just kind of a weird, neat quirk. Anyway, uh, so, you know, TMS and Deke leave that meeting when they finally cancel this thing, kind of dejected. They go back to their countries. Uh, but that's not the end of the process here. With the design goals and kind of theme of having a quirky detective character go on hijinks, Deke would produce Inspector Gadget in 1982, that same year, uh, directly as a result of their meeting with TMS. And TMS, for their part, though they needed a little bit more time to bake, would come up with Lupin Part 3, uh, the Pink Jacket series, which is also pretty wild, but mostly it's known for its uh, distinct art style. It borrows a lot of the soft outlines and rounded character designs from Lupin the Eighth. Uh, and so we get these two things as whole series references. Of course, Lupin the Third is a reference. Lupin the Third Part Three is a reference to itself, but Inspector Gadget would not exist without the influence of Lupin the Third. Uh, and I know a lot of people have, think very fondly of Inspector Gadget, so that's pretty cool. But we can go bigger. You might be thinking, okay, sure, there's a whole series that's just based on this other series, and indirectly as it may be, but it's th through the influence. What could possibly be bigger? Uh, we can go bigger. Check these screenshots out for a little bit, if you will. Uh, on the left side is the final episode of the Red Jacket series again. This is the same one that April and Neil's design came from, by the way. Episode 155, uh, Thieves Love the Peace from 1977. Uh, in it, we see the whole gang uh, unconscious in the arms of this giant robot as the girl protagonist of the episode meets Zenigata to deliver them uh, one last time. Do these look familiar? They might look familiar. Um, the robot is Lambda from, or later seen in, Castle in the Sky in 1986. And the girl is a dead ringer from Nausicaa from Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind, 1984. So you're probably thinking like, oh, you know, I used to respect Miyazaki. I thought he was this great visionary and he was this incredible artist. But now I'm learning he just apes two of his most, uh, you know, iconic character designs straight from a TV cartoon in the 70s. What a fraud, right? Well, you're wrong, because he drew these characters now, but he also drew the characters then as well. And so this brings me to talk about how uh, Lupin III is directly responsible, one degree of separation from founding Studio Ghibli. <clears throat> because Miyazaki, fresh and young-faced in 1970, his first animation job was in Lupin Part 1. Uh, he did a lot of the Green Jacket episodes with some of his friends, and he worked alongside this guy, uh, Isao Takahata, and they became pretty good buddies. They have a very distinct kind of focus on vehicles in their art together. Uh, they came back again in the Red Jacket series to draw episodes of 145 and 155, uh, which is 155 being the one we just saw in 1977. And then after they left that and went on their separate ways, TMS called them in one more time. They had something pretty big planned for these two guys, something that they had absolutely never done before, something that was brand new to them. They had a movie. Uh, so despite everything, despite him just being a humble little animator, TMS placed the directorial role of the Castle of Cagliostro, the 1979 theatrical adaptation of Lupin III on the lap of Hayao Miyazaki. Uh, and so he did. He, he was brand new at this. This is his first ever movie. Uh, he didn't know how to make a movie at the time, but he realized if he wanted to get this thing done on the time frame that was presented to them, on the budget that was presented to him, he needed the best of the best to work with him. And so he called back uh, Isao Takahata and his friend uh, Toshi Suzuki. And they came together and made this movie and it went great. Uh, this is like my favorite movie of all time, animated or otherwise, which is a very subjective thing to say, but I think objectively it's also really good. Like the animation holds up, the backgrounds are beautiful, music is all good, the pacing is timeless. Uh, I think, like, as from an objective standpoint as you can get, it's really good. Um, 
so I recommend you watch it. It's on Netflix. Anyway, my point of this telling this story is they made this movie together, and then six years later, they banded together and founded Studio Ghibli. And they met because they worked together on Lupin the Third, and specifically learned that they could work together well on movies by making this movie their first ever movie. Uh, so I think that's about as influential as a thing can get, is that Lupin the Third is directly responsible for Studio Ghibli being a thing. I think a lot of us generally like Ghibli, and we're glad that this happened. Uh, so yeah, thanks Lupin. <clears throat> What's next? You've, now I've talked at length about how important culturally this show is and why it's in everything and you've definitely heard of it even if you don't think you've heard of it and things you like think it's great and things you like wouldn't exist if it didn't exist but like should I should you personally care about it and the answer to that is also yes um, but I get some common questions right isn't there like a lot of Lupin do I need to have watched Lupin the first and Lupin the second to get it where do I start uh, here's a screenshot of the anime I have on my uh, on hand as of last month or two months ago i got 409 various episodes 50 different folders uh 160 gigabytes of anime right there's a lot to sift through as i mentioned this year is the 50th anniversary of the franchise uh they're doing a new series next month on the 9th uh which is why i want to get everybody up to speed now uh so like where do you begin do i need to have watched the first the second no absolutely not the show is fun and you can jump in anywhere you do not need to start from the beginning for like over 90% of it, probably like 95% of it. Uh, the franchise, there's no continuity whatsoever. Uh, you can just watch a random episode from part two and you're good. You don't need to watch all 155 episodes or 154 preceding episodes to get to the Miyazaki episode of part two. Like you can just watch that one and be done with it. Um, every series is purely episodic pretty much up until the Blue Jacket ones, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, they're all really good standalone. They're all about telling a story using these characters rather than necessarily telling a story about the characters, which I think is a really good way to handle these kind of things. Uh, you can just throw one on whenever. You kind of know what to expect, and it's a lot of fun. Uh, what's more is you can kind of assess the tone of what you're about to watch based on the color of the jacket that Lupin is wearing in said media. There's a little bellwether that holds true and hopefully will continue to hold true. So we have the green green jackets, which were for the first part, and also looks to be coming back for the one that's on the pipe, the sixth part. Uh, this was typically like the first anime for adults, is how it's called in a lot of reviews and things like that. Uh, it's got like a noir type feel, uh, a little bit gritty. Lupin like you know fires a gun and hurts people and he steals from things, uh, and he's bad and he's not like an antihero. He's just like a bad guy. Uh, this was at a time when a lot of the anime that was on the air was about like super fighting robots. So it was a nice change of pace as being like distinctly for adults. Um, I'd recommend definitely watching it. It's good. Um, if people want to know specifically episodes, they can contact me later. I have a whole separate guide for that. Um, then we go into the Red Jacket one, which is his most common incarnation. Probably what people think of when they think of Lupin. This one was more like a Saturday morning cartoon where it was just like a wild antics. Specifically for the part two, though, it's also literally a Saturday morning cartoon. It aired every Saturday in Japan for three years straight, no breaks. There are 155 episodes as a result of that. Uh, you get some very variable quality plot lines in that because they were just cranking these things out. But overall, uh, I think it's really enjoyable, and it's great that you can just throw any of them on and you know, ha generally know that you'll have a decent time. The dub, the uh, Toonami dub for this, is also really legendary. Uh, because it's really irreverent and they've continued to use that dub cast in more recent years for more recent things because of how well received they are uh then we move on to pink uh in 84 and 85 um as i mentioned it's kind of goofy it tries to merge the two things where it tries to have like these heavy plots uh but it's also like a cartoon very cartoonish the animation in this one is the most cartoon like in anything in the franchise um it's very goofy it has these really soft like bouncy round characters definitely watch i used to not recommend this one so much because the only existing subtitles were mistimed and really poor quality even like the ones on crunchyroll but it just got a home video release in glorious hd thanks to discotech media who do not sponsor me but should uh and you can now watch all 50 episodes in perfect 1080p hd brand new translated subtitles uh liner notes great art gallery perfect release so i definitely recommend this one as well now uh and then most recently we have the Blue Jacket, which is from 2014 to 2018. 
uh, where he punches around Europe and Italy and France. This one is different because it does actually have continuity from ep episode to episode, though only within itself. Um, there are a couple nods to previous things in these series, but they're not like crucial to the plot. Uh, and yeah, Bon is talking about uh, Quakey Lupin, which we'll get to. Um, so yeah, Blue Jacket is really, really good as a standalone series. Also, it's shorter. Each series is like 26 episodes instead of 100. Uh, and they're like a plot line all the way through with a couple of filler episodes. Um, the filler episodes for Blue Jacket are also really, really good. Um, surprisingly, they're not like filler in the traditional sense. They just separate smaller plot arcs. Uh, so that ended in 2018. And it looks like we're going back to Green Jacket for part six. So we'll see if it holds up that this one is like gritty. Uh, in that one, in the coming one, he's set to square off against Sherlock Holmes. And he's framed for the murder of Watson, which he's like, I didn't do. I don't murder people. But everybody thinks he's a killer. So we'll see how it goes. That's in October. Uh, anyway, these are the, uh, the kind of archetypes. If any of these sound appealing, hop in at one of these. You can find almost all of them on Crunchyroll, or you can buy the home releases from Discotech. I digress. There are also two other spinoffs. Really good. Uh, there's the woman called Fujiko Mine, which was like a 12 episode show in 2020, uh, 2012. Uh, it's all about Fujiko. She's the, the protagonist in this one. Lupin is a secondary character who shows up sometimes. The adjective I would use to describe it is psychosexual. It's all about the baggage and trauma that Fujiko has and what caused her to become a femme fatale. It's a little hard to watch in that sense. Um, I can only tell you that much about it. Like, if that doesn't sound like it'll upset you too much, give it a watch. It's directed by um, Sayo Yamamoto, who did Yuri on Ice, and like Michiko no Hachin. Um, it's a cool show. It's a really cool show. It looks really good, um, but it is a little bit heavy on the trauma. Like, Fujiko had a rough childhood. She's definitely fucked up. Um, and then uh, we have the other spinoff, which is similar art direction and kind of similar tones, uh, which is stylized as Lupin the like third with the three RD for some reason. Each one focuses on a different member of the gang. We had the Tomb of Daisuke Jigen, the Blood Spray of Goemon Ishikawa, and the Lie of Fujiko Mine. The next ones are uh, do, 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 coming down the pipe. Last time I gave this presentation, the news of two more of them was confirmed about an hour before I gave it, which is the footnote we see there. Um, we're going to get one about Zenigata, and the last one's going to be about Lupin again today. Uh, as of today, yeah, I, I didn't realize I didn't edit that out. Um, but they're very violent. Uh, they're all about like visceral combat and the gang getting fucked up in new and exciting ways, fighting some like superhuman monster that they... I cannot overcome. And it's directed by Takeshi Koiki, who is from Redline. So I've got the little screenshot again uh, of the run cycle he put in Redline. And now it's come full circle because he gets to work on Lupin stuff uh, professionally full time. So uh, it's cool to see that happen. <clears throat> uh, where am I going? Where am I going? <clears throat> so bottom line is there's something for everybody in this franchise, right? Like it's there's so much of it that there's different interpretations and different like tones for the franchise that anybody can appreciate. So like if you like heist movies, car chases, femme fatales, thinly veiled homoeroticism, globetrotting, world uh, history, Nazi punching, homoeroticism, really good music, inexplicable supernatural elements, contrived plot devices, villain of the week type cartoons, domestic slice of life cartoons, found family or homoeroticism, there's definitely a piece of Lufon media for you. And if you ever want help finding that, just reach out to me, don't hesitate. Um, I've got a whole guide I can send you on this kind of stuff or I can work on a consultation basis uh, and I can help recommend something specifically tailored for you. I love to do it. Um, I think this is like a really good selection of screen grabs from all over the series. We've got movies, TV specials, uh, all over the place. Um, that pretty much is it, right? Um, one last note is that the creator of this, um, Monkey Punch, uh, he passed away in 2019, shortly before the CG movie finally came out. By the way, you should see the CG movie. It's quite good. Um, but he had a really storied career working with this, um, well-respected, and I think the world is better off for him having been in it. Uh, and that's pretty much it, right? So I have, I think, about 10 minutes to open the floor to questions. Um, are there any questions? If so, that's, uh, that's all I got. Uh, what's your favorite? Uh, so, like... As I mentioned, the uh, the movie The Castle of Cagliostro is the the best piece of Lupin media. It's uh, kind of weirdly received among like the super hardcore fans. I think everybody generally likes it, but.
but Lupin is much more of a traditional hero than an anti-hero in that one. He's not very, like, tough or mean. He, like, saves a princess and kills, like, a bad guy. Um, so people think he's not hard-boiled enough in that, but I think it's great. You can show everybody, including Mom and Dad, that, that iteration of Lupin. So that's my favorite. And then uh, in terms of the anime series, you should watch the Blue Jacket stuff because the ongoing plot is actually quite nice and refreshing, in my opinion. What are your thoughts about the new Green Jacket? What do you mean, like the color or like the series overall? The new the new Green Jacket series. Uh, I don't know enough about it, right? So like, it looks cool. It's going to take place in Britain, which is, I guess, okay. If it has to take place in Britain, so be it. <laughs> um, <laughs> The, the first promo shot for this uh, series was a really low angle shot of Lupin's ass uh, in front of Big Ben. Like, I don't know why it was that framed like that, but you could just see his leg and his butt and then Big Ben was between his legs, I think. I don't think it was meant to be a euphemism, but when I phrase it like that, it sounds like one. Uh, it's um, euph- <laughs> yeah, uh, a little bit. <laughs> um, I don't think it was. I think I'm just describing it poorly. Um, as I've mentioned, all we really know is the premise is Lupin is framed for the murder of Dr. John Watson, and he's trying to prove to Sherlock that he did not do it. Um, Sherlock real? Yeah. I don't know how they're going to do Like, I'm assuming it's like Sherlock Holmes the third or something, Like, but I don't know. Uh, so that's going to be cool and exciting. It sounds like it's also going to be one that has ongoing plot from episode to episode. I think anime that's purely episodic, the way it used to be, is just not happening anymore like that's just a artifact of the past um so i think going forward all loop on media is probably going to have a continuous storyline at least within its series um there are some returning characters in this from the blue jacket parts so i guess it has continuing continuity from then as well though it remains to be seen if you actually need to have watched those parts to understand their kind of thing and typically with loop on you don't like you see jigen you're like he fires a gun you're like oh i get it i understand Goemon brings out his sword and he's wearing his Hakama and you're like, oh, I get it. I know what this guy's about. Fujiko like unzips her cat suit a little bit too much and you're like, oh, I get it. I understand. So we'll, there remains to be seen if these new characters are like similar where you just see them in their first appearance in the series and you're like, oh, yeah, okay. I don't need to have watched previous stuff. I know what they're all about. Their whole, they wear their heart on their sleeve. I get the whole thing. Um, but if not, then you'll have to watch the Blue Jacket stuff and I'll have to rewrite my guides. It's exciting. There's also uh, Watson's daughter, right? The character art for this little blonde girl just lists her as being named Lily. It doesn't say that she's Lily Watson, but I'm almost positive she is the orphaned daughter of Dr. John Watson. Amelia Watson real? (laughs) That's true. Yeah, Um, so that's exciting as well. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, It's good. In addition, like other stuff I haven't even talked about is in addition to there being all these anime series, there's like a bunch of TV movies that are like all 90 minute movies that are all varying degrees of good and have like you know very similar story beats which is good because again you can just throw one of them on and kind of know what to expect and you're not going to be like upset if it's not super good uh that's i think my favorite thing about the franchise is it's very reliable is you can just kind of put it on and know what to expect and it's comfortable because the characters never change they never grow they're just always these like caricatures of human beings And they'll always be that way, and they'll always be there for you, and that's really comforting. Uh, I think that's that's they can't let you down. Exactly right. And again, there there's like very different interpretations of them. Some of them are a little more uh, horny than maybe I'm looking for, or violent than I'm looking for. But on average, it all kind of evens out in the end, and you get a lot of different interpretations. And to the series' credit, they keep doing this thing where. They'll have like the same people do the mainline series, right? Uh, TMS animation in-house. They have the same composer that they've had forever. Uh, this guy Yuji Ono has done the soundtrack for Lupin since Lupin had a soundtrack. The soundtrack is so good. It's really good. It's some of the best stuff uh, out there. And so the, the old timers keep iterating on this stuff until they're perfect at it, right? Uh, the voice actor for Daisuke Jigen just retired this month. He's going to be retiring in the second episode of this coming series. He'd been voicing Jigen for 52 years straight. He's super good at being that character. The old timers just keep iterating on telling these stories until they're perfect at it, right? But then you get the spinoffs, like um, the one called Fujiko Mine and the Koiki stuff, where they experiment, they try new stuff. Uh, and so you have both of these working in parallel instead of fighting each other. Um, they both get releases and they're just not canon with each other. There's just no continuity whatsoever. And so you get innovation while also getting the tried and true stuff. And I think that's 
part of its ability to stay has to do with that. Hmm. Are there any questions from the audience? I might swap you over to the chatting screen. By all means. Uh, just so I can... Well, we could see everybody. Also, Aleph Alpha, thank you for following. <laughs> oh. I appreciate it. Uh, okay. What? <laughs> I thought this was a really effective presentation. Um, when I first, when Tom first showed this presentation to me, like a slight, like a year ago now, I guess, over a year now. Oh my God, has it been a year? Yeah. Sure has know. been. <laughs> July 3rd, 2020. <laughs> I immediately went and consumed a ton of Lupin media and watched, like, at least some of every part, so... Yeah. Hell yeah. Good stuff. Yeah, I've seen Castle of... Name I can't pronounce ever. Castle of Cagliostro, yeah. It's got the yeah. G-O-I, which is a very Italian thing that people don't often yeah. know how to pronounce. I've seen that movie, like, ten different times now, but I've seen no other Lupin media, so... And that's fine. Honestly, like, that's... You don't need to have, and that's cool. Uh, if you wanted to be that as your sole takeaway, like that's totally cool. Uh, it's yeah. all episodic. It's all just these things in a vacuum, using these characters to tell a story um, instead of telling a story about the characters. And I think that's like part of its lasting appeal as well. Is you can just jump in at any point in the fifty-year history. Yeah, but I think that's that's the appeal of watching it outside of the movie is that I can just watch whatever and have a good time. Yep, they'll never let you down. They never grow, they never learn, they never change. Thank God. Yeah. And Tony, whenever you're ready, you can start sharing your presentation as well in the distance. Um, I am currently just uh, cutting some of... I realized I had music in this presentation, but I don't want to risk you getting, like, copyright claims. Oh. So I'm just going through and uh, getting rid of that real quick. Oh, no problem. <laughs> we're, we're having a good time just chatting, yeah. as is the, the topic of the stream today. I, I think putting it under educational would be a bit egregious of me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I did not cite my sources, so that would be bad. I have citations for everything. Well, my citation is, dude, trust me. Yeah, that's also my citation. <laughs> yep. So, you know, we're, we're a just chatting stream today. And then it wouldn't let me take off the IRL button tag thing when I put just chatting. Uh, yeah, we're all here IRL. Yep. This, yep. this is us. Fun. <laughs> this is Disembodied. In real life, we all saw At each other, like a week ago. We did. It was rad. Okay, let me make sure that rad. this is working. It, com it confirmed that we all look exactly like our avatars. Yeah. We definitely feel oh. like any different. Absolutely. That's more true than you. Like that sounds like a joke, but it's, it's actually pretty true. true. No, it's very true. <laughs> the it fact that you showed true. up in your exact cardigan and flannel, yeah. Tom. Yeah. <laughs> Tom <laughs> Wild. Is Tom. Tom is the most like his avatar. <laughs> He wears the same outfit every single day. That's not true. I just have like eight different pink hands. That rules here. Real yeah, uh, exactly. Real anime <laughs> protagonist energy. Yeah. yeah. My closet I just have eight copies of the same outfit. And I, I will keep buying more. Yeah. 